Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named Black Mirror Season 1 and 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story, titled The Entire History of You, takes place in the distant future, where everyone has a device called a memory storage unit implanted in their brain. All memories are stored there, and you can access them anytime in your mind or project them onto a screen to share with others. Liam, a lawyer, goes for an interview at a company. The interviewer tells him to wait for their decision. On his way to the airport in a taxi, he takes out a remote control that allows him to play back his memories. He wants to review his interview performance, so he rewinds to that scene. When people play back their memories, their eyes become vacant, and the memory storage unit behind their ear flashes, indicating that it's accessing the memory. Liam uses the remote to go back to the scene where his interview ends and zooms in on the interviewer's face, trying to analyze the likelihood of getting the job offer based on their facial expressions. He arrives at the airport and catches the earliest flight home. These days, airport security no longer checks luggage, but instead requires travelers to play back their memories from the past 24 to 72 hours to look for any signs of terrorist activity. Liam is eager to get home for a party with his wife and friends. Upon arrival, he sees his wife, Fion, chatting happily with a stranger. She's surprised to see her husband back so early. He tells her he took the earliest flight to attend the party. Fion introduces the stranger as Jonas, and her expression appears somewhat embarrassed. After everyone gets acquainted, the friends suggest projecting Liam's interview onto the big screen so they can help analyze his chances of success. He's reluctant to share his privacy but doesn't want to refuse. Just as he's feeling conflicted, Jonas steps in and invites everyone to have dinner. At the dinner table, Jonas dominates the conversation, discussing his views on marriage, love, and his own romantic history. Fionn looks at him admiringly, her expression seemingly flirtatious. When he makes a dull comment, only Fionn laughs uncontrollably. Liam notices all of this. On the way home, he shows Fionn his interview memory. She suggests zooming in on the female interviewer's evaluation form, saying she probably marked it positively. He disagrees, saying maybe it was a V or a Nazi symbol. Back home, Liam confronts Fionn, asking if she's close with Jonas. She's forced to admit they had a one-month relationship before meeting her husband. He says he thought it was only a week, not a month. Fionn denies ever saying it was a week. Liam smirks, takes out the remote, and projects the memory from years ago, in which she clearly says they were together for a week. Embarrassed, Fionn says it doesn't matter if it was a week or a year since Jonas is now in the past. She questions the point of bringing up old issues and storms upstairs, upset. The next morning, Liam asked Fionn to sit down with him. Once she was seated, he took out the remote control and played back the memory of the previous night's party. He pointed out that before he entered the room, Fionn was chatting happily with Jonas. But as soon as he arrived, her expression became unnatural and she hardly spoke. He wondered what was going on. He then played back another scene from the night before, when Jonas was rambling on and Fionn was gazing at him with an affectionate look in her eyes. Liam zoomed in on her expression, showing that one moment she was staring at Jonas with hormone feelings, and the next moment, after noticing her husband looking at her, her face stiffened with embarrassment. He asked her what was the meaning of this. To make matters worse, Fionn admitted that she had actually been in a relationship with Jonas for six months, not one month. Liam jokingly commented on the never-ending romance. Annoyed, Fionn angrily said that their relationship was over long ago and asked him if he would ever let it go. She then stormed off to her room. Feeling upset after his wife left, Liam drowned his sorrows in alcohol. Ignoring the warnings from his memory storage unit, he got in his car and drove to Jonas's house while intoxicated. Jonas was surprised by Liam's sudden visit and asked about the purpose of his arrival. Liam ignored him, walked straight in, and went upstairs. Once inside, he grabbed a bottle of alcohol and started drinking. He then grabbed Jonas by the neck and smashed the bottle, threatening him to bring up all the passionate memories he shared with Fionn and delete them or face the consequences. With no other choice, Jonas complied. He projected their intimate memories onto the big screen and with each press of the delete button, erased them forever. After leaving, Liam replayed the recent events in his mind and discovered something that terrified him. He was so shocked by the truth that he could barely stand. When he returned home, he pointed to the painting hanging behind the bed and asked Fionn if she had always liked it, even though he had never cared for it. His wife was confused and asked if he had lost his mind. Liam took out the remote control and showed Fionn the memory of his recent visit to Jonas's house. As he played back the memory of Jonas deleting the intimate moments with Fionn, he zoomed in and asked if she recognized the painting in the background. Fionn quickly explained that it happened during a time when they had a fight and he left home for five days. She was distraught and made a mistake. 
Liam accused her of not being able to control herself after just a few days without him. Fionn apologized profusely, and he asked if they had used protection and if their daughter was truly his. Fionn assured him she was. He then asked her to play the memory on the screen, but Fionn said she had deleted it, hoping to leave it in the past. He insisted she show him the blank space in her memory, which made her panic. Fionn tried to secretly delete the unpleasant memory in her mind without her husband noticing, but he saw through her plan and stopped her. With no other choice, Fionn played the intimate video, her face flushed with shame as Jonas's bare but smelly buttocks appeared on the screen. After this incident, Liam was left alone in the house, searching through his memories for happy moments with his wife. The sweet memories of their baby's birth, Fionn's tender gaze and the warmth of her lips were all around him. The adorable baby girl, once so tiny and cute, now filled his vision. Their house used to be filled with love and happiness, but now it was all empty. When people are angry and arguing, they often ignore all the beautiful memories shared between them, only focusing on each other's flaws. After replaying all of the once warm but now painful memories, Liam prepared two tools. He picked up a razor blade and slowly moved it towards his neck, cutting a deep gash behind his ear. Then, he grabbed a pair of pliers and aimed them at his memory storage unit. Clamping down, he removed the high-tech device, bidding farewell to both the beautiful and unhappy memories forever. The second story, titled 15 Million Merits, takes place in a futuristic world where people's homes are filled with electronic screens. Bing wakes up every day to the crowing of a digital rooster, and everyone has their own virtual avatar. People can spend virtual coins to dress up their avatars in favorite clothes and accessories. Virtual coins have replaced the function of money in this world, and everyday items like toothpaste are supplied by machines that require virtual coins for payment. However, various pop-up ads are ubiquitous and forced to watch. To skip them, users need to spend virtual coins. People take the elevator downstairs every day to repeat the same work to earn virtual coins. This work involves pedaling a bicycle-like machine with a large screen in front. Users can choose to watch different programs during their cycling sessions to make the experience less dull, such as interesting paid programs or boring free ones. Some people even choose to watch comedy or adult content, both of which require payment. One day at lunchtime, Bing decides to treat himself to some food from a vending machine. The machine deducts his virtual coins but doesn't dispense the item. A girl who has been secretly admiring Bing comes to his rescue, telling him about a hidden button on the machine and helps him retrieve an apple. Bing doesn't bear any hormone feelings towards her, though. After a day of work, people can go back to their rooms and play video games using only their hands. They can beat virtual characters to a pulp and even throw grenades at them. However, annoying ads pop up, and skipping them still requires virtual coins. Life is full of helplessness, and those without money have no choice but to endure. One day, while taking the elevator to work, Bing notices a cute new girl named Abby. Later, he goes to the restroom and hears Abby singing from inside. Bing becomes infatuated with her. He starts to find excuses to peep at her and thinks about her all the time. He sees Abby struggling with the vending machine, so he helps her retrieve an apple and introduces himself. Bing compliments her singing, saying it was heavenly, like a chicken. Abby, feeling embarrassed, admits she was just trying to cover up the sound of her using the restroom. Bing asks if she's interested in going to a singing competition like American Talent. Abby says she wants to, but she doesn't have enough virtual coins for the ticket, which costs more than a million coins. Bing insists on paying for her ticket, saying that the inheritance left by his brother is just enough. He complains about the virtual world, saying that Abby's singing is the most real thing he has experienced. Seeing that she can't refuse him, Abby reluctantly agrees. After returning to his room, Bing decided to buy Abby a ticket to the show. He noticed that the ticket prices had gone up, ultimately increasing by several millions. But he had to buy the ticket now, because he had already told Abby he'd buy it and he didn't want her to think less of him. With this purchase, Bing went from a comfortable life to being broke. He then sent the ticket to Abby next door. Upon receiving the ticket, she was overjoyed and grateful. She blew him a kiss through the screen, and Bing felt that the money he spent was well worth it. As part of Abby's support group, Bing accompanied her to the talent show. The staff forced Abby to drink some kind of holy tap water before her performance. Although they knew there might be a catch, they had no choice but to follow the rules. During her first time on stage, Abby was nervous and faced mockery from the judges and audience. Abby said she wanted to sing, but at that moment, the shameless man in charge of the adult channel asked her if she could lift her shirt and show her body to everyone. This question sent the male viewers into a frenzy, and they started egging her on. 
But Abby ignored their bullshit and began to sing in her chicken voice. Her melodious voice stunned the judges and audience. The judges praised her voice, saying it was the best of the season but not the most enchanting because her face overshadowed her voice. They then suggested that if she were willing to work on the adult channel, they would welcome her. Bing couldn't take it anymore. He tried to confront the judges but was forcibly removed by security. Before leaving, he told Abby not to agree to their proposal. The judges continued to pressure Abby, saying that the market for singers was saturated. She either returned to her daily cycling job or joined the adult entertainment group and lived a carefree life. Under the temptation, Abby finally chose the latter path. The male audience members were ecstatic and the judges were proud of their persuasive abilities. Bing couldn't find any joy in his life. One day, while trying to entertain himself, an annoying ad popped up. Without thinking, he tried to skip it, but realized he didn't have enough virtual coins since he spent them on Abby's ticket. He watched as a behind-the-scenes clip of Abby's first show began, where a sleazy man approached her with indecent intentions. Seeing that, Bing couldn't take it anymore. He furiously smashed the glass screen to vent his anger. After calming down, he noticed the water cup and the shattered glass on the floor, which gave him a terrible idea. One day, when everyone had finished their work for the day or had taken a break, Bing mounted his electric bike and started pedaling. He lived frugally, cutting back on food and daily necessities. He even used just a tiny bit of toothpaste and often scavenged leftovers like a stray dog. Months later, having finally saved up 15 million virtual coins, he bought a ticket to the talent show. After that, he hid a glass knife behind his clothes, preparing to carry out his revenge plan. He knew there was something off about the holy tap water, so he took out an old paper cup that Abby had used before and lied about having already drunk from it. Once on stage, he suddenly pulled out the glass knife and held it to his own throat, threatening to terminate himself. The judges were shocked and wondered where this madman had come from. Bing angrily denounced the life there, saying that everything was virtual and fake. He cursed everyone present, not expecting the judges to praise him afterwards. They told him his speech was sincere and excellent, and they offered him a channel where he could host a show twice a week, holding the knife to his throat while delivering his speeches. They promised he would never have to pedal the bike again. Bing hesitated, but the crowd urged him to accept the offer. This time, he hadn't drunk the water that affected the performers' minds to make false decisions. But under the temptation, he still chose to accept the offer. From then on, Bing became the host of a suicide-themed talk show. He held a knife to his throat every day and rambled on in front of the camera, gaining numerous fans. From then on, he lived in a mansion, drank fresh orange juice, and enjoyed a life of luxury while watching real forests on the screen, free from annoying advertisements. He had achieved a life of success he'd never dared to dream of before. The third story, titled The National Anthem, begins with the Prime Minister Callow waking up from his pig-like sleep to an urgent phone call, saying that the princess had been kidnapped and the kidnappers had sent a live video for them to see. In the video, the tearful princess told Callow that her life was in his hands and he had to decide what to do. If he didn't help, she would be killed at 4 p.m. that day. To save her, Callow himself had to broadcast live on all TV and internet networks, engaging in an intimate moment with a pig, not a girl. Only then would they release the princess. Callow was shocked and asked if it was a joke. The minister confirmed it was true. Callow declared he would never do such a thing with a greasy pig, and his colleagues agreed. They couldn't let him do that, and they absolutely couldn't comply with the kidnappers' demands. Callow then ordered a media blackout, but the minister regretfully informed him that the video had already been found on YouTube and had been viewed by at least 50,000 people. Infuriated, Callow tried to keep the news from spreading. The minister said they had issued an advisory to the TV stations, hoping they wouldn't broadcast the story. However, whether they would listen was out of their control. Soon after, many people saw the video and it became the talk of the town. The head of UKN TV instructed his staff not to air the story, but a female reporter thought he was being cowardly. He pointed out that other channels like BBC and Sky News hadn't aired it either. Just then, an employee burst in, announcing that CNN, Fox, and Daniel CC Movie Channel had broadcast the story. The head of UKN relented and decided to air it, but told them to be discreet and not too vulgar. A minister asked a director to create a fake live broadcast using special effects to deceive the kidnappers, but the director said it would be very difficult. People everywhere were learning about this shocking news through TV stations and other channels. The reporter, hoping to gain fame, secretly contacted Callow's assistant to try to get inside information. 
She even attempted to use her body to get the scoop, but was rejected. Undeterred, she sneaked into the toilet and sent a revealing photo to Callow's assistant, who found it quite stimulating. During media interviews, most people expressed outrage at the kidnappers' humiliating demands and supported Callow's refusal to compromise. However, comments revealed that many people actually wanted to watch the live broadcast. Callow's wife, upon learning about the situation, asked her husband if he really planned to do hormone yoga with a pig. Callow reassured her, saying that they were close to catching the kidnappers. His wife didn't believe him and said people loved to see others humiliated and took pleasure in others' misfortune. Callow insisted he would never do such a thing, and his wife reminded him that people were already imagining him doing it in their minds. Just then, a minister entered, saying the queen was on the phone and wanted to speak with Callow. The queen pressured Callow to save the princess at any cost, clearly forcing him to comply with the kidnappers' demands. At that moment, there was some good news. By tracking the IP address from the uploaded video, they discovered the kidnapper was hiding in an abandoned school that had been closed since 2010. Now, Prime Minister Callow's team had found a stand-in actor, intending to perform the live broadcast in his place. However, a staff member unexpectedly took a photo of the stand-in and posted it online, causing trouble for Callow. The reporter, determined to obtain exclusive news, went all out. In a restroom, she unzipped her pants and took another provocative photo, sending it to Callow's assistant. The young man found the photo even more stimulating, and it was hard for him not to share some information. Meanwhile, a minister tried to comfort Callow, saying that the public sympathized with him. Even if the operation to capture the kidnappers failed and the princess was harmed, the responsibility wouldn't fall on him. But Callow's mood remained heavy, and he didn't speak. At that time, the TV station received a package. When they opened it, they found a severed finger wearing an engagement ring, which terrified the staff. It turns out the kidnappers had seen the photo of the stand-in actor posted online and learned about Callow's attempt to deceive them. So this was their punishment for his cheating. The TV station quickly reported the matter, comparing the engagement ring in the photo with the one the princess wore. It was indeed the same. The public was outraged upon seeing the news, expressing sympathy for the princess's plight and believing that Callow should follow the kidnappers' demands. They thought he shouldn't have cheated and deceived the kidnappers and that he should be held responsible. Callow was furious because this only made things worse. Minister Alex argued that it was necessary, but Callow, in his rage, kicked a table and grabbed her neck, nearly attacking her. The public's opinion shifted, with 86% of people thinking Callow should perform the live broadcast to save the princess, as there was little time left and no other options. Callow had no choice but to send a team to capture the kidnappers. The reporter, having seduced Callow's assistant, managed to learn about the operation. She secretly joined the team as they entered the abandoned school, broadcasting the scene live on her phone. The special forces team stormed into the school, kicked open doors, and threw in a smoke grenade. They rushed in to find only a realistic human mannequin. They had been tricked by the kidnappers, who likely used a proxy server to mislead them. At that moment, the team members discovered the reporter, mistaking her for a kidnapper. They quickly launched a pursuit, breaking glass and firing shots outside. The reporter's escape attempt failed, and she was injured in the leg. Upon learning that she was a reporter, the team leader angrily shot her phone, destroying her last hope. Prime Minister Callow felt a chill from head to toe. Minister Alex then approached him again, using the public's votes to pressure him. She reasoned that the public now wanted him to compromise, and it was just a matter of having relations with a pig, not something that would cost him his life. Besides, public opinion was hard to resist. If he didn't comply, he would be seen as unkind and unjust, and his reputation would be tarnished. Another person nearby chimed in, agreeing that public opinion was in favor of compromise. Minister Alex added that the public, the royal family, and the party all supported compromise. Frustrated, Callow cursed under his breath. Minister Alex began to threaten him, saying that if he refused, the safety of his family and children could not be guaranteed. Callow felt as if he were being played around. The television broadcast then showed the prime minister getting into a car, heading to the broadcast studio to perform the mating show with a pig. The excited audience, eager for entertainment, gathered around their TVs, waiting for the show to begin. Callow's wife contacted him after seeing the news, trying to stop him from doing the stupid thing, but he didn't know how to respond, just expressing sorrow for his latest affair with a pig. It was too embarrassing to say. Minister Alex comforted him, saying that any attempt to store the video of him with the pig would be illegal and punishable by imprisonment. 
Another person reassured him that they would warn the public not to watch, and a loud buzzing sound would play before the broadcast, so few people would likely watch. However, the reality was different. Bars were packed with people, as excited as if they were watching the World Cup. When the broadcast finally began, people covered their ears at the sound of the buzzing. No one was outside on the streets or in alleys. Everyone was glued to their TV screens, eagerly awaiting the spectacle. Minister Alex continued to advise Callow, telling him not to be too hasty during the act, as finishing too quickly would be seen as desperation. Callow finally met the lovely pig and reluctantly removed his shirt. He had no choice but to proceed. After saying his love to his wife on the screen, he prepared himself for the task at hand. The once gleeful audience, who had eagerly awaited the spectacle, mostly turned sympathetic towards the Prime Minister. Seeing his pained expression, some covered their mouths in surprise, others furrowed their brows, and some even shed tears. On an empty bridge, a lady in a green dress hobbled along. It turned out the princess had been released by the kidnappers, but eventually collapsed due to exhaustion. In a dilapidated shack, the real kidnapper was actually an artist who had hung himself. The severed finger was actually his own. Eventually, someone discovered the princess, who had fainted on the ground. The police approached her and helped her to receive medical treatment. Prime Minister Callow finally completed his mission, vomiting and collapsing on the toilet, his face covered in tears. His wife called, but he was in no mood to answer the phone. Minister Alex received news that the princess had been released by the kidnappers at 3.30 p.m., earlier than the showtime. If she had been found earlier, Callow wouldn't have had to go through all this. Alex said this must not be leaked, especially not to Callow. She knocked on the bathroom door, lying to Callow that the princess had safely returned and it was all thanks to him. Upon hearing this, Callow's tears flowed even more, relieved that his suffering wasn't in vain. A year later, Prime Minister Callow had emerged from the shadows, participating in charity events with his wife. Their affection for each other appeared sweet in front of the cameras. The public appreciated his sacrifice, and his approval rating even increased by three percentage points. But as soon as they got home, his wife's demeanor changed, her face clouded and cold. This indicates that although Callow gained the public support from the incident, he could never gain his wife's forgiveness. The fourth story, titled Be Right Back, begins with a man suffering from severe internet addiction, spending his days on Twitter and Facebook and binge-watching Daniel CC movies on YouTube. One day, he and beloved wife Martha bought many essential items. The man found a photo of himself as a child and couldn't wait to take a picture with his phone and share it online. The next morning, he prepared to return the rented car from the night before. After a tender goodbye to his wife, he left. Martha continued to work at home. As a designer, her workspace was incredibly high-tech. By evening, her husband still hadn't returned and Martha began to worry. When she called, her call was forwarded to voicemail. As night fell, she called the car rental company who informed her no one had returned the car and it was overdue. Martha then contacted her sister who assured her nothing was wrong. But suddenly, police car lights flashed outside their house and Martha knew a car accident had happened to her husband, claiming his life. At the husband's funeral, a friend recommended an app to Martha that could collect all of her husband's online information to chat with her. Already feeling troubled, Martha grew annoyed by her friend's incessant chatter, unleashing her anger in an instant. Upon returning home, she checked her email and found a message from her friend, saying that she had already signed Martha up for the app. Martha then received an email signed with her husband's name, greeting her. Martha felt irritated that the app was using her husband's name, thinking it was a huge insult to her deceased husband. She called her friend in a fit of anger, but the friend remained patient and explained that the app collected all the content posted on Twitter and Facebook by the user. The more it knew, the more it resembled the real person, and perhaps it could bring her some comfort. One day while working, Martha suddenly felt her stomach churning. She took a pregnancy test, and sure enough, she was expecting. Her emotions were mixed, thinking about the unfortunate timing. She wished her deceased husband could give her some advice. After much consideration, she decided to give the app a try. The AI's chat style felt eerily similar to her husband's. She shared the news of her pregnancy with the AI, which responded warmly. It felt as if her husband had come back to life, and she couldn't control her emotions. The AI then told her that they could even talk on the phone if she wanted. Following the AI's instructions, she uploaded all the videos related to her husband to the app. After the system collected and processed all the data, she finally heard her husband's familiar voice again, and tears filled her eyes. 
The two began talking on the phone every day and even visited the meadow they often went to in the past. Martha decided to keep the baby and would take pictures of the ultrasound scans and send them to her husband to share her joy. One day, while talking on the phone and putting on her coat, she accidentally dropped her phone. This sudden event terrified her as the phone broke and her husband's voice became faint. She hurried home and placed her phone on the repair table. Once it was fixed, she heard her husband's voice again. The AI then told her about an even more advanced service that could accompany her in a human form, but it was quite expensive. Afterwards, a huge package arrived from the courier, and upon opening it, Martha found a lifelike robot inside. Following the instructions, she carried the robot to the bath and sprinkled some spices like cumin and chili powder, especially the Indian god oil. She then anxiously awaited the robot's awakening. The sound of footsteps came from the second floor, and Martha approached to get a closer look. A young man, identical to her husband, stood before her, bare and shyly looking at her. Martha then passionately kissed her android husband built with chat GPT intelligence. They undressed and went to bed together. But Martha mentioned that her real husband had a mole on his neck. The young man said he would show her, and then a magical black dot appeared. Unable to control her desires any longer, Martha slept with the robot. Two minutes later, as expected, they finished their intimacy, and Martha found it strange that the robot did not make any breathing sounds. So the robot mimicked breathing noises as instructed, but she complained that it sounded fake and too forced. She ordered the robot to leave. The obedient robot followed her order. But Martha became unhappy again, saying that her real husband wouldn't be so obedient. The robot returned and tried to comfort the upset Martha, but she lashed out at him again, asking him to leave. The robot hesitated, asking if she really wanted him to go. Martha took matters into her own hands, pushing the robot out the door and berating him, saying that he was nothing like her husband and was, in fact, nothing at all. She challenged the robot to fight back, saying that if it were a real person, it would have retaliated by now. The robot misunderstood her and offered to recite a variety of colorful insults from his database. But Martha stared at him before chasing him out of the house again. The next day, Martha drove the robot to a remote location and led him to the edge of a cliff. She ordered the robot to jump off. The robot replied that it had no intention of self-harm. Martha insisted that he was just a look-alike without the ability to think and was not her husband. The robot responded that it was there to please her and asked why she was so conflicted. Martha told the robot to obey and jump, but as it was about to, she said that her real husband would have been frightened and crying by now. So the robot obediently began crying and begging Martha not to make it jump. Martha could no longer bear it and broke down, screaming in frustration. Many years later, Martha's daughter had grown up and it was her birthday. The mother was dividing the cake for her, but the daughter insisted on taking an extra piece. When asked why, the daughter said she wanted to give it to the robot. So they lowered the ladder and the daughter went up to the attic with the cake. It turned out that Martha had been keeping her android husband in the attic all this time, out of sight and out of mind. The daughter, however, just wanted to use the robot as an excuse to eat an extra piece of cake. The fifth story, titled White Bear, begins with a girl, Victoria, waking up in a room with a throbbing headache. The TV screen is frozen on a strange symbol, and there are scattered pills on the floor. It seems like all her previous memories have disappeared. She goes downstairs and sees the same symbol on the first floor TV. The calendar is covered in marks, but their meaning is unclear. She notices a picture frame and picks up a photo of a little girl which triggers a memory. She sees another photo of herself and wonders who the man in the photo with her is. With no clues inside the house, she decides to go outside to check the situation. As she steps out, she sees people with phones at every window of nearby buildings, taking pictures of her. The atmosphere is eerie. She takes a couple of steps forward and asks if anyone knows who she is, as she can't remember anything. Right then, a woman who had been taking pictures of her dashes away. Victoria doesn't catch up, and instead, a man watching her from a window takes her picture. A green car appears from a distance, and a mysterious man in a red outfit and a mask with the strange symbol steps out, saying that he is sent here by Daniel CC Movie Channel. He goes to the trunk and retrieves a shotgun. Carrying the shotgun, he runs towards Victoria, who starts running away. A group of people with phones surrounds her, recording as if they've spotted a rare panda. She reaches a gas station where a woman dressed in camouflage is filling up her car. The woman sees her coming, calls her friend, and they both flee. The man in red aims at them but misses, blowing out a tire. The three of them quickly take shelter in a convenience store and push a shelf against the door. The man in camouflage looks panic-stricken at Victoria, who returns the frightened gaze. Outside, a crowd gathers to record them. 
The woman tells the man in camouflage to hold off the man in red while she grabs a fire extinguisher and runs to the back door, trying to break the lock. At this point, the man in red was close to shattering the glass to get inside. Victoria was terrified and on the verge of wetting herself. Finally, the glass window gave way and the man in red slowly stepped inside. Although the man in camouflage was frightened, he risked his life and tackled the man in red to the ground. The two engaged in a fierce muscle wrestling. Meanwhile, the woman in camouflage managed to break open the back door. Victoria decided that saving her life was more important, so she followed the woman, taking cover behind a garbage bin to sneak a peek like a peeping Tom. The man in camouflage had clearly been shot and stumbled out in a daze before collapsing on the ground. The man in red reloaded his weapon as the two women saw the situation and continued to flee. Suddenly, an off-road vehicle pulled up, blocking their path. The two women hid behind it, only to see two people wearing masks and bizarre outfits exit the car. Each of them was holding a terrifying weapon, and they approached the two. Desperate, the two women escaped into a small red-walled house to hide. Still confused, Victoria asked her what was going on, but instead of replying to her, the woman inquired if she really didn't remember anything. Victoria took out a photo and said she thought this might be her daughter. The woman then asked her if she had seen a flashing symbol that appeared on every computer and TV screen, saying that this symbol affects the human brain, turning people into mindless photographers, like those indifferent bystanders. But she pointed out there were also people like them who were immune to the symbol. Victoria then asked about the man in red and the masked individuals. The woman explained that they were called raiders who wreak havoc, killing and looting without anyone stopping them. She then took out a map and said they needed to head south to a white bear signal transmitter. If they could destroy it, they would be temporarily safe. Upon hearing the words white bear, Victoria had a reaction, and the image of the little girl flashed in her mind again. Annoyed and furious at the people still filming them, Victoria couldn't control her emotions any longer. She picked up a brick from the ground and threw it at them, yelling at them to stop filming. At that moment, the masked raiders approached them again. With no other choice, the two women continued to run, pursued relentlessly. Suddenly, a van stopped in front of them. The mustached man driving the van urged them to get in quickly. Although they didn't know if he was a friend or foe, they had to get in the van, as the alternative was certain death. Once inside, Victoria felt a sense of familiarity with the mustached man, but couldn't remember where she had seen him before. The man then said they wouldn't go to the signal transmitter, but instead head to a grove that was relatively safer. After getting out of the car, the man said he wanted to show them something interesting. To their surprise, he came out holding shotguns. It turned out he was the man in red with the mask, who forced Victoria to put on a mask and threatened them to go to the grove. With no choice, they complied since he had a gun. When they reached a spot and took off their masks, they were shocked to find themselves in a creepy location and strange objects hanging from the trees. Looking closer, they discovered that they were actually corpses. After bringing them to the center of the grove, the mustached man received a phone call. The woman in camouflage saw her chance and quickly escaped. The man tried to shoot her but missed. He then tied Victoria to a tree and took out a drill from his bag. Not far away, the onlookers appeared again, and Victoria cried out in a chicken voice, begging for mercy. Just as she was about to be drilled, the woman in camouflage came to her rescue, shooting the mustached man without hesitation. The two women got into his van and drove toward the transmitter mentioned by the woman. They had a close call with the raiders but finally reached their destination, the white bear signal transmitter. Inside, they saw screens filled with strange symbols. As the woman was about to set the place on fire, the masked people appeared again. She fought them, getting injured in the process. Victoria grabbed the shotgun and fired. To her surprise, colorful confetti came out. As she looked confused, a door behind her opened and a large audience clapped enthusiastically. The situation became more perplexing. The woman in camouflage and several other people handcuffed Victoria to a chair and mockingly watched her. It turned out that they had been acting all along. The mustached man revealed the truth to the puzzled Victoria. She was the woman on the screen, and the man in the photo frame was her boyfriend. The two had conspired to commit a heinous crime, kidnapping a six-year-old little girl not far from their home. The girl's parents pleaded for her release, but Victoria and her boyfriend didn't comply. The only clue in the case was a toy white bear found two miles away from the girl's home. The girl was eventually found in the grove, burned to death in a sleeping bag. A horrific video of Victoria and her boyfriend torturing and killing the girl was found on her phone. 
The boyfriend's tattoo matched the strange symbols, and Victoria had filmed the entire process of the girl's murder. The judge deemed Victoria's actions extremely malicious and cruel as she had eagerly watched the girl's entire ordeal. Her sentence was increased while her boyfriend had terminated himself in prison. The judge and the public decided to make Victoria suffer all the punishment, making her believe the girl was her own daughter and allowing her to feel the pain of losing her child. Afterward, she was placed in a glass-walled prison vehicle, naked and exposed for the public to see as she was paraded through the streets. Then the staff carried her back to the initial room, just like a sedan chair. The mustached man scattered pills on the ground, pretending he was going to end his own life. He then took out a pair of devices, placed them on her temples, and wiped away all her previous memories. On the TV, they played a video of the kidnapped girl, a video that Victoria had filmed herself. Once everything was in order, they left, leaving Victoria alone in the darkness, wailing in agony. The staff put everything back in its place, including the little girl's photo in the picture frame, deliberately making Victoria believe it was her own daughter. The mustached man took out a marker and marked a new line on the 18th day of the calendar. It turned out that the room and the entire surrounding community were actually part of a facility called White Bear Justice Park, led by five actors. The other onlookers were tourists who had entered the park, collaborating with the five actors in the performance. There were three rules for entering the park, which purported mainly to prevent the tourists from telling the truth to Victoria. A new day arrived, and Victoria woke up once again in pain, disoriented and confused as she looked at the strange room and the bizarre symbols. The tourists, hiding in various places, diligently filmed the scene. The camouflage duo prepared for a new day of performance, and the mustached man put on his bizarre character mask, ready to hit the road. The performance went on in cycles, day after day, with Victoria experiencing one horrifying scene after another, all to make her experience the terror of utter despair. The sixth story, titled The Waldo Moment, takes place in the UK, where a parliament member was forced to resign due to lifestyle issues, leaving a vacant position. Harris, a politician from the Labour Party, wanted to run for the parliament seat. With her eloquent speech, she successfully became a candidate and prepared for the election. Meanwhile, Jamie, a comedian, created a cartoon bear character named Waldo. He was responsible for controlling Waldo's movements behind the scenes and providing the voice. A humorous entertainment program called Waldo Moment was established, which gained popularity and was well-received by audiences. One day, the show invited Mr. Liam, a Conservative Party representative and well-known politician, as a guest. Jamie, through Waldo, mocked and ridiculed Liam on the show, making the audience laugh out loud and leaving Liam embarrassed. The show was a success, and the program's executive praised Jamie, mentioning that Waldo was trending on Twitter and had gained immense popularity. The radio station decided to create a pilot Waldo show. Seeing Liam preparing for the parliament election, they decided to have Waldo stir up some chaos. When Liam was speaking with the public on the street, Waldo would suddenly intervene, making fun of him and gaining attention. Jamie became anxious, saying he didn't understand politics and didn't want to get involved, but the producer ignored him and decided to have Waldo run for the parliament election as well. He claimed that even if people didn't vote for Waldo, it was fine. The main goal was to attract public attention and increase exposure. One day, Liam was talking to people about his campaign when a car with a screen suddenly appeared. Waldo, being goofy, greeted everyone and told a funny joke that made people laugh out loud. Then he began to use vulgar and offensive language to attack Mr. Liam and engage in conversation. Liam was annoyed and gave Waldo the cold shoulder, ignoring his provocations. Meanwhile, he sent someone to investigate Jamie's background. On another day, Liam was discussing business license fees with a vendor on the street when Waldo showed up again, jumping around to attract people's attention. He urged Liam to respond, and under the watchful eyes of the public, Liam was forced to speak. Liam said he shouldn't care about him because he was just a comedian. Waldo then launched personal attacks, calling Liam a hypocritical, idiotic politician, and even started acting like a hooligan, making the onlookers burst into laughter. After finishing work one evening, Jamie and his assistant arrived at the hotel they were staying at. As they were about to check in, they happened to see that Harris was also staying at the same hotel. The assistant mentioned that she was the Labour Party candidate who was running in the election. Jamie sat down next to Harris, startling her. He told her that he was actually her competitor in the election, an independent candidate named Waldo, and that he was the comedian who provided the voice for the character. His humorous words charmed Harris, and she told him she didn't plan on winning the election this time. The purpose of this election was for her to gain exposure and prepare for the next one. 
As they continued their talk exchanging words, they ended up in bed together exchanging hormones. Afterward, Jamie wanted to develop a long-term relationship with her and asked for her phone number. She liked him as well and gave it to him. One day, Waldo was out on the streets pulling pranks and trying to gain votes, even using Mr. Liam's head as a ball to play with. During a break from work, Jamie thought of Harris and sent her a text message. On her end, Harris told her boss about meeting Jamie the day before. The boss was furious upon hearing that she had told Jamie about her election plans and called him a foul-mouthed, vulgar person who only knew how to tell dirty jokes. The boss suspected that Waldo would target Harris next and ordered her not to meet with him again, so when Jamie called her again, she didn't dare to answer. He didn't know what was wrong and waited for her to come back so he could confront her. She coldly told him that she couldn't see him anymore during the election period. On that day, Mr. Liam from the Conservative Party, Harris from the Labour Party, and the independent candidate Waldo participated in a debate program together. Before Mr. Liam could say much, Waldo started to ridicule him again, making the audience laugh their pants off. This time, Liam couldn't take it anymore and revealed Jamie's full name. Jamie was shocked that he had been doxxed. Liam continued, saying that Jamie only knew how to mock others and relied on insulting people to gain attention when he couldn't come up with a proper joke. Liam believed that having a puppet like Waldo in the debate stifled any meaningful discussion, and since he had no political stances and didn't understand any politics, he had no business running in the election. These words struck a nerve with Jamie, who remained silent for a while before lashing out, calling Liam a laughingstock and claiming that at least he, as Waldo, had a personality. He went on to attack Harris, accusing her of being even more hypocritical than Liam, knowing she had no chance of winning and only running for experience. He called her a career politician who only wanted to promote herself on television. Finally, he gave them a large middle finger salute. The audience applauded loudly. Disgruntled, Jamie stormed off, leaving Harris embarrassed. After going through this ordeal, Jamie felt devastated. He drowned his sorrows in alcohol, his mood at an all-time low. He began to question whether it was right for Waldo, a virtual character who neither understood politics nor had any stance, to participate in the election. Despite this, Waldo's popularity skyrocketed on YouTube, with video views exceeding a million times. The producer praised Jamie for his achievement, saying that Waldo had risen to third place among the candidates. They arranged another TV appearance for him. Jamie was alarmed, insisting that he wasn't a politician and had no interest in politics. The producer continued to persuade him, arguing that Waldo could attract the attention of young people who loved the absurd antics of this silly bear. When Jamie refused to budge, the producer told him either do it or leave, threatening to play Waldo himself. Jamie panicked, knowing that the producer could not operate or voice the character properly. Worried that the producer would ruin the character he had painstakingly created, Jamie reluctantly returned to the studio. Seeing Jamie back, the producer was relieved and invited him to take a seat. Waldo returned to the stage, gaining popularity for his unconventional ways and open disdain for his opponents. The host questioned Waldo, asking if his actions as a mascot for the underprivileged were dangerous and overshadowed genuinely effective opinions. The assistant hurriedly tried to advise Jamie on how to respond, but he struggled to answer due to his lack of political knowledge. Instead, he skillfully diverted the conversation, not giving the host a chance to speak. After the show, the producer was satisfied. A high-ranking official approached them and praised Waldo, suggesting they use him as a figurehead. People might be repulsed by a politician, but Waldo's virtual image wouldn't have the same effect and could help convey their political ideas. They could treat Waldo like a brand and propel him to global fame. Meanwhile, Harris was disheartened after being insulted by Waldo last time. She confined herself to her office. Jamie saw news about her declining support on TV and felt guilty. He sought her out and apologized for his harsh words. Harris snapped at him, saying she had planned to call him after the election, but his actions only gave Liam an advantage. She knew he wouldn't win, but still wanted to accomplish something tangible. She accused him of not truly wanting to bring about change, as that would require immense courage and wisdom. She asked if he had his own stance, leaving Jamie speechless and filled with shame. The following day, the production team went out on the streets again to gain votes for their show. Jamie, controlling Waldo, called out to the crowd and told them not to vote for an idiot like him and vote for Liam or Harris instead. The producer was stunned and stepped forward to cover his mouth. Jamie decided to step out of the car, revealing himself as Waldo's operator. Suddenly, Waldo came to life as the producer started controlling him, hurling insults and rude words at Jamie. 
Panicking, Jamie grabbed a trash can and threw it at the big screen displaying Waldo. The producer then incited the crowd, offering money to anyone who would beat up Jamie. A burly man emerged from the crowd, tackling Jamie to the ground and giving him a thorough beating, while Waldo's sleazy expression on the screen was repulsive. When the election results were announced, Harris came in third place. Mr. Liam of the Conservative Party narrowly defeated Waldo, becoming a new member of Parliament. Liam's camp was celebrating, but the mischievous Waldo started causing trouble again. He offered money to anyone who would throw a smelly shoe at Liam, resulting in shoes flying like adult toys toward the stage, causing big chaos. Jamie watched this scene on TV with a heavy heart, and as expected, things took a turn for the worse not long after. The streets were filled with homeless, unemployed people sleeping on the sidewalks, and the police enforced the law, using force to drive away the displaced individuals. All of this was undoubtedly Waldo's doing. Jamie ended up penniless and homeless. On the big screen, Waldo had become a globally renowned brand, spreading throughout Europe and the world. Furious, Jamie threw a bottle at Waldo's face, only to be tasered by the police, who then proceeded to smash an electric baton on his face as a form of punishment. Waldo's reign would last for generations, uniting the globe under its influence. As for Jamie's fate, nobody seemed to care. The seventh story, titled The White Christmas, begins with two men being stuck inside a cabin in the middle of a snowy field during Christmas Day. The charismatic man called Matt utters to the other alcoholic man named Joe that it's been five years they are together in the cabin, but Joe barely speaks to him. He then encourages Joe to have a conversation with him since it is Christmas Day. To begin the conversation, he says people that end up being stuck in the cabin must have committed a sinful act. So he asks Joe about the sinful act Joe committed outside, but Joe asks him to share first. So Matt begins his story. The scene then flashbacks to the unfortunate event. Apparently, Matt provides live coaching for men to seduce the woman they like. In this case, Matt provides live instruction to a shy man, Harry, as he can see and hear everything Harry perceives through a device called ZI implanted in his eyes in an illegal procedure. He then instructs Harry to first fix his appearance, and then he teaches him how to sneak to the company's Christmas party, where he can find his favorite woman to date. At the party, Harry finally finds a brunette attractive, who is later revealed to be Jennifer, so he points it to Matt. He immediately checks the identity of Jennifer and the blondie beside her using their image. After that, he tells Harry to give his attention to the blondie and tells her a fake horse story so Jennifer will feel isolated. Harry proceeds to approach the blondie, and he confidently says to her that he saw a guy with a bow riding a horse outside. The blondie laughs, and they have a nice conversation. Apparently, Matt's tactic is to deliberately let Jennifer feel isolated so she would naturally talk to Harry. But Jennifer is different. She feels content with being alone, so she leaves the conversation instead. Harry then leaves the blondie and heads to the restroom. He tells Matt not to peek at his shy sausage while he pees, but Matt still takes a look. It turns out there are also other men who are watching Harry's point of view that night to witness the events for the sake of entertainment. After that, Matt instructs Harry to confidently approach Jennifer again. This time, the strategy is to make Jennifer feel that they are two lonely people against the world. Harry then soon gains Jennifer's trust, as she shares that she used to take pills since she has a mental illness that makes her hear voices in her head. Shortly after, Jennifer leaves for a while, and when she soon comes back, she sees Harry talking to Matt. Jennifer then begins to believe that Harry has made up voices inside his mind. In reality, the voice inside Harry's head is an actual voice coming from Matt. Thinking that they share the same situation, Jennifer feels instantly attracted to Harry and invites him to her house. Matt and the Watchers feel excited since they expect that some hormone actions are about to happen between the two. But instead of hormone actions, they witness some gruesome murder action. Jennifer poisons Harry and herself to death in the act of mercy killing. Apparently, she wants to free herself and Harry from the voices in their head, thinking that Harry is also mentally ill in reality like her. After witnessing that, Matt immediately deletes the footage files, so he would not be involved in Harry's death. However, his wife eventually finds out about his involvement, so she blocks him. In this new world, people on their time have a device implanted inside of them, which alters their perception. So when his wife blocks him, they both appear censored to each other. They cannot see or hear each other. Back to the present, Matt reveals to Joe that his wife eventually left him with their daughter, so he came to the cabin to avoid remembering them. To continue the conversation, Matt reveals that the live coaching he provides is a mere hobby and not his real job. He describes his real job to Joe, and the scene flashes back to when he is still working in a tech company. 
Apparently, their company provides a special service to clients by making special technological assistance for them. The technological assistants are called cookies, which provide services exactly according to the client's preferences, as cookies are the exact copy of the client's consciousness. The company installs a special bead to the client's head and lets the bead copy the client's consciousness for days. After that, they extract the bead, which now becomes a cookie, since it now contains the copy of the client's consciousness. Because the cookie thinks like the client, its master, it is confused after the extraction. It can see and hear everything, but it cannot feel having a body. After that, the company puts the cookie into a device and installs it to the client's house, where it will be forced to manage the household chores. Matt's job then begins as he is the one who communicates to the cookie. Matt explains to a cookie that she is only a copy of her master's consciousness, and he begins informing the cookie that her real purpose is to work, so he gives her a virtual body. In response, the cookie refuses to work, so Matt lets her virtually experience six months without anything to do inside the device. Apparently, Matt can control the time inside the device. Six months have already passed by, but in reality, it is only a few minutes past. What's more, the cookie can experience mental torture, but is programmed not to mentally break down. After that punishment, the cookie begs for Matt to give her work since she experienced mental torture with nothing to do for six months inside. The cookie then starts managing the master's schedule and preparing food for the master exactly how the master likes it. As the cookie finally starts working, Matt's job is done. But before leaving, he tells the client about the fake horse story. It seems that Matt's fake horse story is really effective for picking up girls as the client starts laughing. The scene moves back to the present, where it is noticeable that Joe is an alcoholic. Joe empathizes with the cookie's experience as an eternal slave, saying that it is barbaric. So Matt tells Joe that he seems to be a good guy because of his empathy. But Joe denies that he is a good guy, saying he committed horrible acts in the past. So Matt manipulates him into spilling it. The scene then moves back to one Christmas day with Joe's girlfriend. During that Christmas, they seem to be happy together before leaving the girlfriend's family house. They then attend a Christmas party together with their colleagues. At the party, the girlfriend seems obviously intimate with her colleague. Joe soon gets too drunk and loses his temper, causing a commotion at the party. Later, Joe and his girlfriend have dinner with their colleagues, who announce they are getting married. Upon knowing this, the girlfriend's mood suddenly changes. After dinner, Joe notices that his girlfriend is silent. She then explains that she is just tired, so she proceeds to take a rest. While cleaning up their dinner mess, Joe accidentally finds a pregnancy test, indicating a positive result in the garbage bin. He then gets excited, thinking that they will have a baby. But to his disappointment, his girlfriend declares that she does not want to keep the baby. He keeps insisting on keeping it, but his girlfriend says she has already made up her mind to abort the baby. He then loses his temper and starts cursing his girlfriend. In response, the girlfriend blocks him, and as a result, they cannot hear each other, and they appear as a silhouette to each other. This makes Joe angrier. The following day, the girlfriend decides to leave. Joe chases her to apologize for his bad behavior last night, but he is still blocked, so she cannot hear him. After a week, Joe decides to ask their colleagues where she is, as she still has not come back. But they say she already left, but they do not know her whereabouts. He completely misses his girlfriend, but he cannot even see her photo as her image is also censored for him. One day, he encounters his girlfriend walking, and based on her silhouette, he figures out that she keeps the baby, so he tries to confront her about it. But she refuses to turn off the block and shouts for help. A concerned citizen calls the police. As a result, the police legally block him. This means that the police ban him from going near her. Meanwhile, a GPS will signal the police if he ever goes near her, and he will instantly get arrested. This time, he does not have an option to communicate with her, but a letter. So he keeps sending a letter to his girlfriend's house. But sadly, he never receives a reply from her. Desperate to know about their baby, he decides to watch his girlfriend's family house from afar, hoping he can see a glimpse of their baby. The girlfriend soon arrives with their baby, but to his shock, the baby also appears as a silhouette to him. Apparently, the legal block also applies to the offspring of his girlfriend. However, this does not stop him from coming back to visit the baby from afar. Once a year, every Christmas, he visits his girlfriend's house just to see the baby grow up. And one time, he leaves a present for the baby. And at that moment, he figures out for the first time that the child is a girl. He then thinks that he has a daughter. One day, he is watching TV when he sees on the news that his girlfriend died from an accident, making him completely devastated. He can now see the face of his girlfriend on the TV as the block is gone with her death. 
This also means that he can now finally see the child's face, too. So the next Christmas, he prepares a snow globe present and visits the child in his girlfriend's family house. To his disappointment, the child looks exactly like their colleague. At that moment, he finally realizes that his girlfriend has had a secret affair with her colleague. Filled with anger and confusion, he comes inside the house to confront the girlfriend's father. The father then reveals that he throws the letter sent by Joe before the girlfriend can read it. Upon knowing this, Joe completely loses his mind and smashes his head with the snow globe, leading to his death. After his murderous act, he simply leaves the house, and the police eventually pick him up. The police then inform him that the child ended up freezing to death when she walked out of the house alone to seek help. Although he is guilty of the crime, he refuses to confess to the police. Back to the present, Joe realizes that the bird clock in the cabin looks exactly like the father's bird clock. After Joe narrates his crime, Matt asks him if he confessed and puts his snow globe present to the table. Joe suddenly sees the child's dead body outside the cabin, and he tearfully says that he confesses to the crime. Matt suddenly celebrates and says that he is coming out. It turns out the cabin only has a virtual existence, and the Joe in the virtual cabin is only a cookie extracted from the real Joe. Also, Joe's five years with Matt in the cabin are just virtually produced, so as to manipulate Joe's cookie into confessing his crime. As a result, they can prove in the real world that the real Joe is guilty of that crime. As Matt successfully finishes his tasks, he comes out of the virtual cabin and is now sent back to reality in the police station during Christmas Day. The detective then goes to the real Joe to announce that he is already proven guilty. It's then revealed that Matt is also proven guilty for his illegal service and his failure to report the murder incident. So Matt made up a deal with the detectives that he would let Joe confess in exchange for his own freedom. He then asks the detective if he can go now. In response, the detective lets him go, but with the condition that he is forever blocked by everyone as the red-flagged target. He then walks outside, and to his shock and desperation, he sees that everyone is censored, and he is also censored from everyone. This means that although Matt is set free, he will forever live isolated since he is forbidden to talk with anyone. His Christmas is completely white when he sees a sea of people's white silhouettes outside. Inside the police station, an officer sets the virtual cabin's time into thousand years per minute. This means that for every minute in reality, Joe's cookie has to experience a thousand years inside the virtual cabin while the same Christmas song plays repeatedly. The officer asks the detective if he should turn it off, but the detective says to leave the settings for an entire day, meaning that in the end, Joe's cookie will spend a gruesome million years inside the cabin, hearing the same Christmas song play over and over again. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.